Hello, everyone. Welcome to Intergenerational Effects of Trauma Exposure, presented by Tanya Jovanovic and presented by ISTSS. We're so glad you've decided to join us today. My name is Holly, and I'll be your staff host for today. Please note that all lines have been muted in order to ensure the highest quality audio, and today's webinar is being recorded. If you have a question for the presenter, you may enter it by using the Q&A feature at any time. They will address, it will be addressed towards the end of the presentation. Uh, please do not use the chat feature for questions for the presenter as they could get lost in the chat feed, but do use the chat feature if you wanna make a comment or participate in discussions. Today, we're welcoming both ISTSS members and non-members. If you are not currently a member of ISTSS, consider joining. Membership carries many benefits, including discounts for our annual meeting, members only events, special interest groups, and much more. Check out the benefits online. And visit the ISTSS website for the latest information on the 2023 annual meeting. Read the most recent stress points articles, find out about upcoming publications, check out available public resources, and visit our Friday fast facts sections with past topics, including firearm violence, climate change, medical trauma, and more. At this time, I will introduce today's moderators who will in turn introduce today's distinguished speaker. We have Dr. Anthony Ruffy. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Sleep Disorders and Research Center at Henry Ford Health in Detroit, Michigan. He completed trauma-focused graduate training in clinical psychology and now studies the role of sleep disturbances in trauma recovery. Dr. Jovanovic is one of his mentors. And we have Dr. Alana Berman, a clinical psychologist with expertise in trauma-informed care and trauma-focused practices, helping individuals and families recover from intergenerational trauma. She's been affiliated with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill since 2020 as a postdoc and adjunct assistant professor as, and is also in private practice. So without any further ado, I will turn it over to our moderators and our distinguished speaker. So welcome everyone and take it away. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. Dr. Tanya Ivanovich is a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences and the David and Patricia Barron Chair in PTSD Neurobiology at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. She completed her PhD in neuroscience from Emory University in 2002, where she continued to work as a postdoctoral fellow and then as an assistant professor, developing her research program in trauma-related disorders and directing the Grady Trauma Project in Atlanta, Georgia. In 2018, she was recruited to an endowed chair position at Wayne State University to direct a translational neuroscience center for trauma. She now directs the Detroit Trauma Project, which investigates the impact of urban trauma exposure on the brain. Her research employs psychophysiological and brain imaging methods to examine biomarkers of risk for trauma-related psychopathology, and her lab developed a novel human fear conditioning, fear inhibition, and fear extinction paradigm for PTSD patients. Dr. Ivanovich has received multiple NIH grants and two awards from the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation, and she is currently the principal investigator on two R01 research grants from, uh, excuse me, research projects from NIMH. She has published over 250 peer-reviewed papers and served on national and international grant review panels. Dr. Ivanovich is also dedicated to training the next generation of scientists and has mentored trainees at multiple levels from high school to junior faculty. And I'm honored to be included in her extensive list of mentees. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ivanovich for an exciting talk on the intergenerational effects of trauma exposure with a focus on the behavioral and biological mechanisms of transmission. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, for that introduction. It's such an honor to be here. I want to thank ISTSS also for hosting this webinar. And I want to thank everybody who made time to attend today to listen to, to this presentation. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. We can do. Can everybody see my slides okay? Okay, Anthony, thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so I want to start off first by thanking my lab. So I have a really large group of people involved in this research, and everyone is contributing to getting really excellent data I'm going to tell you a little bit about today. But first, I want to introduce the Detroit Trauma Project, which is a large group of research assistants and postdocs, and um, we have a lab manager, Sterling Winters and Sophie George, who are really helping to lead this effort. And I also want to talk a little bit about the Grady Trauma Project, which is where I was before I came to Detroit and Wayne State. And a lot of the data that I'm going to talk to you about comes from my work at the Grady Trauma Project. So with that, I wanna kind of jump right in. I wanna make this first statement that trauma exposure is common and it is global. And I think it is really important to note, I like to reference this paper from the World Health Organization that looked at uh, trauma exposure across the globe. So they looked at high, middle and low income countries. And the truth is that there is no place in this world that is safe from trauma exposure. It happens everywhere. And so it is really important to understand what the consequences of trauma exposure are. And here I really want to focus on childhood trauma exposure because we know that childhood trauma exposure really has these long lasting effects. When we talk about childhood exposure, we kind of arbitrarily choose 18 as the end of childhood. That's partly because of how our questionnaires, uh, how our society, how our thoughts are, but this is not really a biological construct. So it's also important to know that different trauma at different points during development might have different kinds of impact. But here I'm really gonna focus on this period prior to age 18 and how that might have these long lasting effects. Uh, a few years ago, PBS NewsHour did a special on childhood trauma in the United States. Uh, this was a really excellent uh, news article, just really kind of emphasizing and bringing awareness to how pervasive childhood trauma is in the United States. And just to give you some numbers for a sense of scale, it really is epidemic proportion. So these numbers are already uh, out of date. Uh, in the 2017, the World Health Organization estimated that around the world globally, up to 1 billion minors have been uh, exposed to violence, whether physical, emotional, or sexual violence. In the United States, we're really talking about three and a half million children referred to Child Protective Services. This was in 2019, prior to the pandemic. I imagine the numbers have just increased since then. And so again, to note specifically about child abuse or neglect, almost 700,000 children in the US. This was only in the year 2019. So again, just to really understand how pervasive this impact is and how important the consequences of childhood trauma are. So one of the earliest studies and the most consequential studies that most people will know when they're talking about childhood trauma is the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, or ACEs. It was funded by Kaiser Permanente. This was in the mid to late 90s. Uh, and really, they started to look at these adverse childhood experiences that included a number of different things. And they found that people who experienced four or more had substantial impacts, not just on mental health, but on well being, social functioning, work performance. It really had these long term consequences. But there are several significant problems with the ACEs study. So it didn't really capture the frequency of exposure, it just said, you know, did this happen to you? Yes or no? Almost all of the participants were over 60 years old when they were reporting on experiences that happened to them prior to age 18. So there's quite a bit of retrospective bias, meaning that we're kind of relying on people remembering what happened to them and that memory isn't always reliable. So retrospective data has a lot of different problems. So it's important to know that these are all adults at the time when they were reporting on their childhood trauma. And then a really significant issue was that minorities were very much underrepresented. So this was a, primarily done in California. 75% of the people in the study were white. 
and there was very little focus on adversities that might disproportionately affect minorities. So in the mid 2000s, there was actually a substantial effort done to really focus on minority youth. So there was a study in Philadelphia that came out in 2016 that really also looked at adversities related to exposure to discrimination, racism, community violence, neighborhood violence. And uh, so it's become more inclusive. And that's really what my lab has focused on. We have really focused on looking at the impact of neighborhood violence or community violence on children's brain development. So I just wanna show you one of these studies that we did. This was uh, again done at Grady Trauma Project. Jennifer Stevens was um, a postdoc at the time in the lab. She's now a professor at Emory. But she looked at uh, the brain response to different images when children were watching pictures on the screen. So these were um, eight to 13 year old children. So they were youth at the time. It was an all black American population recruited from Atlanta. And they're shown images on the computer screen in the MRI machine. And the two faces that they're seeing, it's the same person, but sometimes this person has a fearful face or looks afraid. And what we know is that fear activates these limbic areas of the brain that are very responsive to threatening cues. And one of those is the amygdala. And so she found that this amygdala response was much increased in children who had higher levels of violence exposure. So here you can see on this graph, uh, there is a significant increasing relationship between the amount of violence exposure that the children had experienced up to this point in time in their life, which is again about middle childhood, and how much their amygdala is activated. So we do know that exposure to violence impacts the brain in childhood, but how does this impact intergenerational effects, which is what I really want to focus on today. So as I talked about, you know, a lot of the data I'm gonna talk about today is childhood, but we also know that the adult, the, these effects continue into adulthood and are observed in the next generation. Now, I wanna point out that the data I'm gonna talk about today, again, because I'm focusing on trauma that happened prior to the pregnancy of the, the woman in this case that we're looking at, the effects of intergenerational trauma are not ones that directly impact the fetus at the time of gestation. And that's important to recognize that there are many effects during pregnancy that can have effects on brain development in the child. So whether it's stress hormones, whether it's pollution, whether it's microbiome, there are many mechanisms by which stress in the mother can impact her unborn child. And that is actually not what I'm talking about today. What I'm going to be talking about are the events that the mother has experienced much before she was ever pregnant with this child. And then I'm gonna really focus on what we see in her child when it's a little bit older. So just to give you a little bit of background on intergenerational effects. So one of the most consequential studies that have looked at intergenerational effects of trauma are by Rachel Yehuda and her group who have really focused on uh, victims of Holocaust and their children. So it's important to know that the children themselves were never in the Holocaust. So again, this is trauma exposure that the parent experienced prior to the birth of this child. And so there's been a lot of data showing that those offspring of mothers and fathers who survived the Holocaust have higher rates of mental health problems. And then another study that was con consequential was looking at Cambodian refugees who came to the US and their daughters, again, who had no direct trauma exposure themselves, had much higher anxiety uh, than their mothers. And then a recent meta-analysis, this is looking at many different studies that just came out last year and looking at several studies, looked at this uh, relationship between maternal childhood abuse and psychopathology in the children. And so again, mental health outcomes in the children. I'm gonna kind of superimpose this red line here. 
This is a zero correlation, so no association. So all of these blue dots to the right of this red line are indicating an association. And this hollow little diamond here is the overall effect if you average all of these studies together. So showing that there's um, you know, pretty moderate size effect of maternal childhood trauma on the next generation. So coming back to the Grady Trauma Project, just to tell you a little bit about this study, it was one of the first studies that really focused on civilian trauma. Most of PTSD research to date has really focused on military populations. And there is good data also in military populations showing intergenerational trauma. But there's been a pretty significant oversight when it comes to urban trauma. And part of that is because urban trauma is in fact very complicated. It's very chronic, it's pervasive, it's often comorbid with poverty, different socioeconomic issues, uh, racial discrimination. And so we have sort of a, a lot of different factors that are impacting outcomes. And so for a long time, people would kind of stay away from this. But uh, Carrie Ressler, who was my mentor at the time, really wanted to understand some of the risk factors and resilience factors in urban trauma population. And so we started collecting data at the Grady Memorial Hospital in downtown Atlanta. And we found that really the rates of trauma exposure in the primary care waiting rooms where the participants were recruited, so they're not recruited from mental health clinics, in primary care, almost 90% of the individuals we saw had experienced a major trauma and almost half of them met criteria for lifetime PTSD. So what we know of military populations is that the numbers, you know, the percent of people who might develop PTSD ranges anywhere from 10 to 20%. So this is actually twice as high than what we see in military populations. That's important to understand. And then the other things that we found was that not only was exposure common, but people would experience multiple types of different kinds of trauma. So that was more of the rule than the exception that someone would have two or three or even four more types of trauma. So that means that someone might be a victim of domestic violence, also be in a car accident and also experience a natural disaster. And then the other thing that was also uh, really important to understand about this population was that trauma exposure started really early in life and we had really high rates of childhood trauma exposure. So I want to share with you a couple of case examples from our population just to give you a little bit of an idea. This is from notes taken by research assistants who are working with these participants. So 8622 is a 33 African-American female, 33-year-old African-American female from the age of six. She has sustained severe physical and emotional abuse by her father and repeated sexual abuse by her stepbrother. She was unwilling to talk about any of her traumas, but has significant symptoms of PTSD. She is also drinking about a six pack a day and is currently using cocaine. She has no close relationships with any of her family members. She has no friends, no hobbies, nor is she interested in leaving the house. So in this study, she participated along with her nine-year-old child. So uh, what we know is that she has four children. Her eight-year-old stays with her mother and the other children stay with her. She sounded annoyed by her children. She should say, my kids aggravate me and is looking forward to having them stay with her mother for the summer. She described her relationship with her 15-year-old daughter as she can't stand me, her 16-year-old son as iffy, her nine-year-old as he loves me, and her eight-year-old as he doesn't know me. Having met with her nine-year-old son, I was surprised by her lack of warmth towards him. So this is also an important thing I wanna mention because we're talk gonna talk a little bit later about parental warmth. So in our study, we were focusing on nine-year-olds, and this was a study that was funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, really trying to understand different developmental periods of brain development when trauma had a major impact. 
But these critical periods or sensitive periods that we might think of when there are windows of time where either trauma or maybe protective factors might have a bigger beneficial effect. So this was a, a review paper written by Luby in 2020. I highly recommend it. It really focuses not just on the impact that parents have on their children with regard to adversity, but also how they might protect their children from adversity and how this happens throughout you know, early development. So again, we were really interested in brain development and we use several different measures to look at the impact of this. So one of the measures, and most of my mentees know this, um, is fear potentiated startle, or in this case, I'm gonna talk a little bit about dark enhanced startle. So the way that we measure startle in my laboratory is by these electrodes under the eye, you'll see here. And uh, when a person hears a really loud sound, they blink. And when they blink, we can measure that muscle contraction when people blink. And then what we can do is we can put them in different situations or contexts that might increase the size of that blink. And we can then again measure how much bigger that blink is. So in dark enhanced startle, what we do is someone hears a loud sound in the light, in the light and then also that same sound in the dark. And when the lights are off, that muscle contraction is much bigger. And so this difference is what we call dark enhanced startle. So when we looked at dark enhanced startle in the children, we found that it was associated with anxiety in the children. So children who had higher dark enhanced startle also reported higher levels of anxiety. And then when we looked again at intergenerational effects, we actually found that children here whose mothers had really high levels of childhood abuse had higher dark enhanced startle than children who, whose mothers had low levels of abuse. And again, this was abuse that she experienced, the mother experienced prior to the birth of this child. And we looked at things that might explain this difference. And so we looked at child's age or sex, child's own trauma exposure. We looked at maternal PTSD, maternal depression, and none of these factors explain that relationship. And in fact, maternal childhood physical abuse remained significant even after we controlled for a lot of these variables. And I wanna just briefly show you data from the case example that I told you about. So this is 8622, this is her child. A startle response, and you see these red lines are her child. The blue line here is from a different child and who did not have a mother with abuse. And you see that this really big difference. So another way that we look at the uh, startle response is something that we call a uh, fear potentiated startle. And here what we do is we use a Pavlovian conditioning experiment. Uh, you know, if you remember your Pavlovian Psych 101 studies, the way that that happens is that you might have two stimuli like we do here. And this stimulus, which we call the condition stimulus, the reinforced condition stimulus, is paired with something negative. So in Pavlov's dogs, it was paired with food and they, you know, he looked at the dogs drooling. We're actually, because we're really interested in the development of brain structures and systems that underlie fear responses, we use what's called aversive Pavlovian conditioning where this stimulus is a negative one. Now I wanna reassure you that we're not doing anything terrible to children. What we're doing is that we have this vest that they're wearing. You see this girl have this, has this vest on her chest and there's gonna be a puff of air that comes out of this vest. And it comes out whenever this shape appears on a computer monitor in front of her. And this puff of air is not painful. It doesn't hurt, but it is annoying. And we need it to be annoying so that she will learn that every time she sees a red shape appear on the screen, she is about to get this puff of air. And then we're gonna measure how much she blinks when she's expecting this puff of air. 
And in fact, what we typically see for the CS plus, which is our danger signal in this case, is a much bigger blink response. And that muscle contraction when she blinks is much bigger than when she sees the other signal that appears on the, on the computer screen that means she's not going to get this puff. And so this is something that we call fear discrimination or the ability to recognize threat and to respond to threat appropriately. So when we look at our children, we do, do see that across this fear conditioning session, the more pairings that happen, the more they respond to the red and the blue bar here, showing that they're appropriately learning that this you know, red bar is associated with this negative outcome. However, this is in children between ages eight and 13. If we actually break them up by age groups, we see that there's a big change after age 10. And this really big difference between the red and the blue bar emerges mostly at this age. So this is kind of thinking about the change between childhood and adolescence. So then again, coming back to the experiences of the mothers of, this ch of these children, uh, Anae Stenson, who is looking at uh, different kinds of experiences, the mother looking at intergenerational effects. Uh, she classified mothers depending on their childhood trauma history and their PTSD symptoms. And here are the four groups of mothers. And you'll see this group here, the high trauma and PTSD group. So again, moms who have both uh, high childhood trauma, but also PTSD symptoms, their children are showing, again, that lack of difference between, in this case, it's an orange bar, but this is the same stimulus, CS plus and CS minus. And then to try to better understand what's happening at the level of the brain, we use functional MRI in children. And so a research assistant in the lab, Miriam Rita, who is now in med school, she uh, looked at these uh, functional MRI scans, and what she was really interested in was how this brain region, the amygdala that I've mentioned before, is connecting with some of the prefrontal cortex regions. And so she could look at how these two regions are activated together while we're doing the fMRI. And we found in that children here who had mothers with childhood physical abuse, the more abuse the mother had witnessed or experienced, the tighter this connection between the child's amygdala and these prefrontal regions was. So these are all just data to show you that maternal childhood trauma is in fact having effects on her children as late as middle childhood. But what we don't know is how does this happen? How is it that something that happened to the mother gets embedded in whether it's her brain, her behavior, her biology to carry over into the next generation? And so there are several different mechanisms. As I mentioned, there's also gestational mechanisms that I'm not gonna talk about, but there are substantial effects of uh, stress in utero. These are effects, again, that predate the transmission. So we wanted to look at whether maternal behavior explains some of what we're seeing. Is there something about mothers who have been abused as children that makes them respond differently to, to her, their own children? And so the answer to this is, in fact, yes. And these are very strong effects of parenting behavior. And so one of the things that we found uh, this is looking at, this is boys versus girls. So mothers who had survived sexual abuse as children show a lot less warmth that's here to their daughters. They don't have the same effect with their sons. So there's something specific about how mothers respond to their daughters where they are a lot less warm. And these are using questionnaires to measure maternal warmth. So it's also important to note that there's bias involved in people reporting on their own parenting behavior. But this measure of parental warmth was much lower in mothers who had experienced childhood sexual abuse towards their daughters. 
Then looking back at our startle measure, we also found that mothers who had very low levels of maternal warmth here, so mother reported warmth, was linked to higher levels of dark enhanced startle in her child. So this might be one of the ways in which the startle in their child is related to maternal warmth. We also know that mothers with really high levels of childhood trauma experience a lot higher levels of what we call parenting stress. So this is also a questionnaire where parents are asked, you know, how much are you distressed by being a parent? Like how much are your parent, you know, your children stressing you out? And it's essentially what it's measuring. But again, it is a self-report measure. But here we also looked at uh, the impact of parenting stress. And what this is, is it's a mediation analysis where we looked at maternal PTSD in this case, rather than maternal trauma. We looked at psychopathology in the child, looking at their anxiety, depression symptoms. And we found that in fact, parenting stress explained why mothers with PTSD might have children who have also behavioral or symptoms of anxiety and depression. So we do know that there's a lot to do with parenting and how the mother responds to her children can explain at least some of what we're seeing in the child. But I wanna talk a little bit also about some of the biological effects. So here, I wanna mention genetics or epigenetic transmission. So there are several ways it's possible that the mother and the child share the same genes and that these genes confer risk for anxiety, depression, PTSD. You know, the problem with just a simple genetic model is that it doesn't really explain the impact of trauma. So that would mean that the mother and the child would have the same outcomes, even if the mother had not ever experienced childhood trauma, because it is her DNA that she was born with that might be shared with the DNA that her child was born with. So this is where epigenetics come into play and it's gotten a lot more focus and awareness lately because what epigenetics uh, means is that the DNA actually gets activated. So in most cases, DNA is uh, methylated, which means that the genes are actually not being turned into protein. They're kind of resting. But methylation or demethylation means that the genes are going to be expressed and demethylation can be impacted by environmental stress. So one of the earliest studies, so we're gonna talk a little bit about epigenetics. So this study actually was one of the most consequential when it comes to looking at epigenetics. So uh, Brian Dias and Carrie Ressler, Carrie Ressler was my mentor at the time, published this page, paper in Nature Neuroscience where they actually looked at mice and they looked at multi-generation transmission of fear conditioning in mice. And just as a side note, this paper had a really hard time getting published because no one thought that this could actually be a true finding that this could happen. So what happened is that Brian mated, uh, first he fear conditioned a male, then after that male was fear conditioned to a very specific odor. So in animals, we talk about F0 is that first, gen the original father here. F1 is the offspring. So here you'll see in this graph, I'll show you this bar. This is the F1 generation showing fear to the odor that the father was conditioned to. And so there's important to know that there is no behavioral transmission in this case. So in fact, they did things like IVF and cross-fostering. Uh, one of the important things uh, with using male mice that made it a little bit easier is they could just take sperm from the male who had the fear conditioning and then, you know, get the female pregnant. So again, the male has no interaction with those pups. And then they also found that it carried over for two more generations. So the grandsons of that original father would also show fear to this odor. So this is what made people think, 
okay, it can't, there has to be something that's happening in the body that's carrying over some of these, something like memories of this thing that happened to the father, but we don't understand how that happens. And I will say, we still don't quite understand how that happens, but we have some hints about what might be important things. So one of the particular genes that has been a focus in the PTSD literature now for a while is the FKBP5 gene. And what that gene does, it regulates the stress response. So it's part of the HPA or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that releases the hormone cortisol. And most people know that cortisol is related to stress response. And so we've known for a while that FKBP5 is one of the genes in the stress pathway that might be related to vulnerability to PTSD. And so uh, Torsten Klengel, again, using Grady Trauma Project data, CTQ here is childhood trauma exposure, and this is in a replication cohort. And I'll just show you this black line here is that uh, this particular genotype of the FKBP5 form, this intron, and you'll see that it's decreasing, this methylation is decreasing with increasing trauma exposure. So it is seems to be that if you have a particular gene and you have a lot of trauma, this particular location, FKBP5, is impacted by that trauma. So then the uh, Rachel Yehuda's group, who again have been studying Holocaust survivors, they actually found something very similar. So they found in that this same gene here in the orange bars, these are offspring of Holocaust survivors. And I know this doesn't look like a big difference, but it's actually a very significant change in both a replication sample and their original sample, there was a decrease in methylation of that FKBP5, that same location that Torsten found in the offspring of Holocaust survivors. The other thing that's, uh, that was really interesting, and this blue bar is significantly lower than the other two bars, but this was if, if the mother was in the Holocaust prior to age 11, so this was, again, impacted by her early experiences, not as an adult. Once she was an adolescent, there's very little difference between people who had no exposure to Holocaust or Trump violence. And then the other thing that was really interesting is that here, the F1, and is the offspring, in this case, these are human offspring, F0 here uh, is the parent, and there is a correlation association with the methylation of this gene in parents and offspring. And then the other question is, what does this mean? What does this do? Does it actually have an impact on the brain? Because the brain is ultimately what we're interested in and where we think that a lot of the mental health symptoms are going to be emerging from. So we uh, there was a study here by this group who looked at DNA methylation and in fact found for that same gene, FKBP5 methylation, that individuals who are depressed here show, again, different connectivity between regions of the brain with increasing methylation. So this also suggested that not only is something about the genetics and epigenetics different, and that we know this gene is a related to the stress response, but it also might be related to how the brain responds. So I do want to note, you know, as I'm saying all these things, we don't have any causal data here. These are all associations in people much after the trauma has happened. We don't have data from before the trauma happened in, in, in the human studies. And so a lot of work still needs to be done to really understand causality here and to understand you know, how, how these things actually happen. So we have some clues, as I said, but we still don't know how this happens. So I wanna briefly talk about some of the positive effects 
that we have, not of intergenerational trauma, but how adults can buffer some of the traumas that either they, the parents themselves have experienced or the children experience. So I wanna talk a little bit about this study. Uh, it used the ACEs. And so remember when we talked about the ACEs, the, the study found that if you had four or more adverse childhood events, you are more likely to have a host of negative outcomes. So this study, which was done in the UK, actually looked at, again, children, um, this was looking at adolescents, but they were looking at those who had four or more compared to those who didn't have any adverse experiences. Uh, they looked at a bunch of different outcomes. I'm gonna show you here this measure of lower mental well-being. So it's a little bit counterintuitive because the higher the score, the worse the mental health. So yeah, because the measure is lower mental well-being. So you'll see these red bars, the solid red bars are those who had four or more adverse events. And the deprivation quintile, this is looking at socioeconomic status. And so they were looking at, you know, with increasing adversity like poverty and, uh, you know, low neighborhood, high community violence. The more that increases, again, the lower the mental health outcomes. But here's what's really interesting. This gray bar is adolescents who had zero adverse events. So you see that solid red, solid gray are very different. But this hatched red line were adolescents who had four more, but always had an available adult present who they trusted. And so it doesn't really matter who that adult is. It is important that they are available and trusted and that this child was able to rely on them and see that it pretty much takes away this uh, adverse event effect on mental health. And that was true for work performance, for smoking behavior, several different outcomes that just having one adult who's always available to the child shows this decrease. So one of my colleagues has really been looking at how this human amygdala prefrontal circuit that I was showing you earlier was related to early maternal childhood trauma exposure. She was really thinking about how parents might change this relationship. Two minute warning, Tanya. Okay. Um, and she found that, um, that in fact, parents can influence this relationship early during childhood, but once the child reaches adolescence, then parents have a lot less of an influence. So we see this critical period here as well. So I was listening to Nim um, give this talk. We were in a symposium together. And I thought I would check to see what startle looks like in our kids if their mother is present or not. So I'll show you, this is a picture of my daughter doing startle, just so you know that I don't just torture other people's ch children, I to torture my own as well. And so Sana Van Rui looked at data that we had been collecting where we startled the child and the mother at the same time. Now, as it happens with a lot of studies, sometimes things don't happen like they're supposed to. So after about 100 kids, we looked back and about half of them, the mother actually didn't get startled at the same time. And this might be because um, she didn't want to, or maybe she had already been startled at a previous visit, or there might be different reasons why she might not. But in that case, while the child was getting startled, we would tell the child, your mother is gonna be in a different room. You're gonna see her as soon as you're done. So there's no way that the mother and child can communicate through this booth. The only difference is that the child knows that mom is here versus doesn't. So when the mother is in a different room, we see that same pattern that you saw before. Adolescents show this big difference between the red and the blue bar. We see really good discrimination between danger and safety. Younger children aren't quite getting there. But if the mom is in the room right next to them, then there's no difference in age. Even the younger kids are actually responding very appropriately to fear conditioning. So 
again, we don't know why this happens. The mom is not telling them what to do. They can't hear her. They can't see her. All they know is that she is near. And this makes them just either attune better to what's happening, makes that learning work better. Uh, we looked at whether or not maternal warmth had anything to do with that. This is just that red minus blue bar. And so the bigger the value here, the better. And we found that, yes, if mom you know, reported being a warm mother, then we got better discrimination in the, in the kids. But if mother is not around and she's not warm, then it's the worst. kind of, we see the reverse. And then the last thing I want to show you is really looking at that warmth, looking at amygdala activation during imaging, again, showing the fearful faces and the not fearful faces. And here in the blue line are mothers who have low warmth, and they show that association that I've shown you before. The higher the violence, the higher the amygdala activity. But mothers who report having high levels of warmth kind of really take away that effect. And so we're seeing this buffering where even high levels of violence don't have this increased effect on the amygdala. And just to leave you with a quick little uh, data from this randomized clinical trial of an early parenting intervention, they did an intervention, uh, it was called the ABC uh, intervention that promoted attachment between parents and caregivers when the children were babies. And then when the children were older, they were again, in the same age range, around 10 years old, they would show them in the scanner pictures of mom versus a stranger. And here's the intervention group, here's the control group. And you see that uh, there's a big difference in how the children respond later. Again, they're randomized to this condition and we don't know exactly what some of these regions are that are being activated, but this is 10 years after this very brief intervention. So again, it's pointing to some hopeful ways in which parenting can impact brain development in a positive way. So just to summarize everything we've talked about, Childhood trauma has long-term neurobiological consequences for the individual as well as their children. So we're seeing these intergenerational effects. Maternal childhood trauma is associated with psychopathology and neurobiology in her child. And those effects may be due to parenting behavior, genetics, or epigenetics. And again, with the caveat that we still don't quite know how that's happening. We do know that mothers with trauma have more parental stress and that can impact their children. We also saw that alterations in DNA methylation and stress-related genes such as FKBB5 have been seen in trauma-exposed mothers and their children and is related to the degree of childhood trauma exposure. And then just to end on a positive note, we know that parents can also have very protective effects on their children and that warm parenting can buffer fear responses and brain activity in their children. And with that, I want to thank everybody for listening. These are my kids who have survived the intergenerational trauma of their mother being a neuroscientist and have thrived into young adults. So I want to thank everybody and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Tanya, for that really, really exciting talk on some cutting edge research. Um, I have a couple of questions here that I've been fielding in the Q&A, so I could just get us started with these here. So the first question I have is, up to how many generations can intergenerational trauma effects be observed? So I think you touched on that with some of the animal models, but I'm not sure if you discussed that at all in humans. That's a great question. So, you know, it's really hard to do this work in humans because humans life cycle is so much longer. And, uh, you know, in rodents, you know, you might have your answer within a few months. Uh, in humans, it might take decades. And so I don't know that a lot of work is really focused on, especially the neurobiological outcomes that we're focused on into like a second or third generation. I do want to note that we're fortunate enough in Detroit that we are now collaborating with a group that started a project 30 years ago 
in Detroit, where we are now able to look at outcomes in the second generation, but also the third generation. And so hopefully we will have some data that speak to that very soon. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, another question here, actually follow up from the same um, uh, attendee, uh, any differences compared with fathers? Yeah, great question. So I actually get this question a lot. Uh, in the animal study that I just showed you, they did use sperm and it was focused on fathers. They did the same study with females, but because females are really hard to separate the effects of gestation and behavior in animals, the males are just quote, slightly cleaner. So there are some studies with uh, veterans showing, again, in those studies, they've looked also at methylation in sperm and have found that there are intergenerational effects of males. Now, Rachel Yehuda's group has looked at the mothers and fathers who survived Holocaust. The effect does seem to be stronger in mothers than fathers, but there are some effects of, of fathers as well. And how about any distinctions between the left and right amygdalas? Yes, that's also a great question. So a lot of the work in laterality um, has been really mixed. And so in a lot of our studies, what we call the bilateral amygdala means that we're looking at activity at both sides of the brain. There are studies that have found you know, sometimes the left amygdala seems to be more related to post-traumatic stress symptoms. So I don't know that there's a definitive answer to that yet, but there might be more evidence for the left uh, than the right, but it kind of depends on the study. Interesting. And so, of course, you discussed DNA. Um, any findings regarding RNA? Oh, <laughs> So um, yes, another caveat is that I am not actually a geneticist. I collaborate with a lot of folks who are geneticists. So some of the data in animals have looked at microRNA and have looked at those pathways rather than DNA methylation. Uh, I think uh, Brian Dias's work has found some differences in microRNA, but I'm not as familiar with that literature. Okay. Okay, and what do you think about post-traumatic growth? So specifically, do you think people can experience genuine personal growth following traumatic exposure and whether post-traumatic growth could be transmitted across generations? Oh, what a great question. So I definitely believe there is post-traumatic growth. There are you know, several groups that have developed questionnaires that target that because it goes even beyond resilience. We think of resilience as the absence of negative effects in the face of trauma, but growth even goes beyond that. It's an indication that you actually might do better uh, in, in the aftermath of trauma than you would otherwise. And I don't know of any studies that have looked at that intergenerationally, but that's a great question. Um, one of the, the data that speaks to post-traumatic growth, there's a, a story about the uh, Hanoi Hilton. This was a POW camp during a Vietnam War where almost uh, a lot of the individuals who were POWs in this camp, like a uh, disproportionate number of them turned out to be senators and congressmen, you know, and there was always this question about what it was, and it was one of the worst POW camps in history. And so that, that's when people started to think about maybe post-traumatic growth. And that's a very extreme example, but I do think that there are many examples where we see post-traumatic growth. And, and I think that we really want to focus on some of the more positive outcomes and not just the negative ones. Great. Yes. Yeah, so maybe building off of that and um, getting into any sort of uh, clinical implications. So this question is, what are some effective ways for parents to help their children develop resiliency in the face of adversity, especially if the parents themselves 
have experienced trauma. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do right now is uh, focus on those interventions. One of the uh, really good ones that I'm excited about, it was called the Strong African American Families. This is in uh, a group out of UGA that worked with uh, families in rural Georgia. And it's really interesting. They really focused on uh, not just trauma, but racial discrimination, different kinds of adversity, and how to help parents help children cope with some of those outcomes. This intervention was done, it was a seven week intervention that was done when the children were you know, 11 years old. And now those children are in their 20s and they've been, you know, done a lot of neuroimaging work with them. They've also looked at epigenetics and they found that this intervention compared to a control group reversed some of the epigenetic effects we're seeing, uh, showed impacts on brain development. And in, you know, 10 years later after this seven week intervention. So there's definitely a lot that can be done there. And I encourage people to look into the Strong African American Families Program. And they've had several different offshoots where they've kind of really built up on adolescent health and, uh, and resilience. Great. And maybe I'll just take one more here because we have just under well, three minutes now, and then we'll actually um, get a copy of the remainder of these questions because we have a lot so that we can maybe follow up on these after. But uh, just to wrap this up and again, building on what you just mentioned there, um, could you speak to any PTSD treatment outcome studies that have looked at the starter reactions pre and post? Okay, that one sounds like a plant, but yes. <laughs> Um, yes, we've done several different studies, and uh, we use Startle a lot these days as an um, assessment measure for treatment response. And so we can use it uh, whether we're doing psychotherapy or we're doing pharmacotherapy. So we did one study um, where we you know, used a medication, there was no psychotherapy, and we saw that the Startle responses improved after treatment in those who were on the drug versus placebo. In an uh, outpatient, uh, this is an in in uh, it's a intensive outpatient program at for veteran health at Emory University, uh, where they're doing a lot of psychotherapy, CBT and CPT. We did find in prolonged exposure therapy, there are substantial effects of treatment. Uh, on that group. We also just recently finished a collaboration with a group in California that looked at acupuncture for PTSD, and they also had a control condition. So they had an active acupuncture and a sham acupuncture, and the active ac acupuncture group showed really significant improvements. And here we're looking at extinction of the startle response. So again, ways in which uh, that fear response can be better regulated. But we have been using this measure as a readout for symptom improvement so that we're not only relying on patient self-report of symptom severity, which is a lot of how we are currently assessing PTSD. Great. Well, I think uh, with that, we can wrap up. Uh, uh, Dr. Ivanovich, thank you so much for your time and for giving such an amazing talk. And um, as I mentioned in the chat, this talk is uh, was recorded, so it will be made available afterward, and we will work on following up with some of these remaining questions that we weren't able to, to get to during the talk. So thank you so much uh, again, Dr. Ivanovich, and for everybody who attended. Thank you.